and I'm thankful for the word I just heard. Thankful also earlier when the children were saying that one verse in Hebrews 2, 1, about paying much closer attention to the things that we've heard. I think that's very important. Um, we hear a lot, but we may not always pay attention. And what's the purpose of it? It says later on in that, um, in that verse, it says, so that we don't drift away. And I believe that's also the reason that um, we're sharing you, with you this morning about the visions uh, and the burdens that we have that the Lord's laid upon our hearts. Uh, I was thinking about this as we uh, do every single year about when we say we're going to give a vision. I was thinking when I was a lot younger, I was sitting in church and this wandering preacher came in. Um, we you know, it wasn't a wandering preacher, but it was just someone I didn't know. And he was preaching behind the pulpit. I remember he was, he kept on saying, if you don't have a vision, you're going to die. And I was pretty young. So I thought I'm really going to die if I don't get a vision from the Lord. Um, but he was quoting from Proverbs 29. If you look there, there's a proverb that says, Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law is happy. And, um, and it really stuck with me that if there's no vision, the people will perish. And I was thinking about this in uh, 1 Samuel. If you think about what had happened to, if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, if you think about what had happened to the people of Israel by the time Samuel had come, you know, there was, we, in fact, we just heard about Moses. He was the great deliverer of Israel. And then after that, there was Joshua. And then if you think about it, what do we really have as the leader? We have some stories and judges. We have some local rulers, but there wasn't really a leader. And, um, you know, you read some of those stories, they're a bit chaotic in judges. And that's because they didn't have, uh, they didn't have a direct vision. They didn't have a direction. In fact, uh, you know, the book of Judges ends with every man just did that which was right in his own eyes. So there was a, um, they were just kind of lost in their direction. And by the time you get to Samuel, if you remember Samuel in the history of Israel, Samuel is the very, very end of uh, the time of the judges. And it's about to transition into the time of the kings. He appointed uh, the first two kings, uh, Saul and David. And it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Uh, I think of what it says there about how it was so precious because it was rare. It wasn't something that people really got a lot of. They, um, I you know, they could read the book of the law, right? They could they could read what Moses had read, but it wasn't the same thing as receiving a word from the Lord. They had the Bible, what would have comprised the Bible back then, but they didn't have a vision. And that's, and you know, it says later on about Samuel that it was so important. What Samuel had to say was so important that none of his words failed or fell to the ground. Um, people were listening to the things that he had to say. And so it's it really is critical, not just for, for our people to have a vision, uh, but that there's a vision that the Lord gives each one of us, that the Lord is speaking to each one of us. Imagine if we as a church, we come here Sunday after Sunday, we meet on Wednesdays, we meet Saturdays, we have different activities throughout the year. We have the Lord's Supper. We have all these things going on. We have people speaking here uh, behind the pulpit. We share in, in, the, in the chairs here. But imagine, though, that the Lord doesn't speak to us. <laughs> So we do all these things, and there was a time in Israel that uh, we read of uh, more than more than once where there was just a famine of the Lord speaking to us. So it's very, very important that this isn't just a few people that have a vision or that hear from the Lord. It's important that each one of us hears from the Lord. So with that being said, I'll share with you uh, something the Lord's really been uh, speaking to me on in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. been thinking, uh, meditating a lot on this recently. Um, we, 
one of the things that um, we'll pick up in verse three here, one of the things the Lord has been showing me is where I've been exerting my energy. And he says, uh, starting in verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And that is such an important verse right there that Paul gives to us. We walk in the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. And I love how the, the King James has a little parenthesis here, almost like Paul is reminding people in verse four, um, almost like, a, by the way, these weapons that were given, as we read here in verse four, they are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, or some versions say fortresses. And then it goes on to say casting down imaginations. And I think, I think in the NASB, I think I saw that it says speculations, which we heard of very recently, how dangerous speculations are. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And then he follows on with this in verse 6 in saying, And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. I love that the uh, you see that a couple of times he says in Corinthians when in speaking about being disobedient, and then he um, references having a revenge or like a zeal to not to not have that disobedience when or when the obedience is fulfilled when we are casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Um, and I was thinking about this as as I was preparing that. You know, the, there's certain settings that are probably the same for each one of us where we find ourselves uh, throughout the day, the week, the month, the year, where most of the same, most of the settings are the same. Um, most of us come to church and most of us go to work, go to school. Maybe there's some sports activities, recreational activities, maybe. Um, but for the most part, we know where uh, we spend most of our time. And as I was thinking about where, where does this warring, if there's warring after the flesh, where does it happen? I can't say I've seen in, um, you know, since I've been here, so almost six years now, I don't think we're coming to church fighting with one another. I don't think that this is the place. Maybe there's something, maybe um, we don't see it, but I don't think we're, this is where we do it here in church. We're not warring with one another. And maybe at school, I don't know. Um, maybe the kids might be not getting along with other kids. Maybe there's some warring going on there. Or maybe there's some warring going on um, at work for some of us who have jobs and we don't get along with certain people. But I think that the majority, I'd have to say this for myself, that the majority of the temptation to have any sort of war, where I would war after the flesh or with the flesh, I think it's at home. I really believe that it's at home. And I think this applies to each one of us. I was thinking as, as a child, you say, who did I war with the most? And I have one brother. Quite easily, my brother. <laughs> Quite easily. is greatly lopsided how much more I warred with my brother than with anyone else. And I found myself in other situations where I could let the flesh rise up. But think of each of the relationships in the home that we have with husband and wife, and with a parent and child, brother and brother, brother and sister, sister and sister, maybe some for those of you who live with grandparents, maybe with your grandparents. There's so much that um, for us to fight against and fight with each other in the home. And if there's one thing I'm, I'm sure the devil loves, I'm sure what he loves, is that we're fighting with each other at home and not against the devil. And I'll, I'll show you here, we'll turn to a few verses in just a moment about fighting the devil. Um, but if we're spending all of our energy fighting each other, and I really believe, I, as I was thinking about this, this really applies a lot more for me, and I think for m many people, it applies much more at home than it does in most settings that, that we find ourselves in. So let, let me turn to this in Ephesians 6. I remember every year growing up, we had a... Uh, like a Bible summer camp. And I remember every year they always did a skit with putting on the armor of God 
And I was always looking for, I always wanted to be the guy, the little boy picked out that would put on the helmet and put on the, you know, grab the sword. And, um, and I think it finally stuck. The truth of it finally stuck with me over the years about putting on the armor of God. And we read a lot of great things in Ephesians. Um, in fact, let me turn back to Ephesians 5 first. I'll look at a few verses. Ephesians 5, 7, it says, uh, don't be partakers with them. And it's referring to uh, basically the ungodly, the, the verses before. Uh, For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Um, And we'll see here a couple times that he, Paul refers to us as being children of light. So there's a certain behavior that is expected of us. Now let, me, now let me go to Ephesians chapter 6, the next chapter, and we'll pick up in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So he said all these things that he's told us to do uh, from Ephesians 1.1 1, 1, all the way through Ephesians 6.9. Now he's saying, finally, I'm going to close out by saying this, that you have to be strong in the Lord and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then once again, he says here, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <clears throat> Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Therefore, having stand, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, the things we just read, none of these things that the Lord has given us are weapons that we can really even use to fight each other. I can't, you know, the Lord's not equipping me with the Word of God so that I can speak a evil word or a rough word against my wife or against my children or my children towards each other. Um, but the Lord's given us these things back in verse 12 to fight against the, the devil and spiritual wickedness. These are the, this, is the, this is the battle that we should be fighting. Let me turn over to another place in Romans 13. We see something uh, somewhat similar. I like how what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13. I'll pick up in verse 12 and I'll go through verse 14 here. He says, the night is first spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So remember, we just heard about putting on the whole armor. We heard about being children of the light. And here he says, put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. And there's that strife, that uh, that bickering that could go on in the home. So we don't we don't want any works of darkness. We want to put on the armor of light. And then he follows it up. I, I like what he says here in verse 14. But what are we supposed to put on? He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to put on, the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't make any provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So by putting on the armor of light by putting on Christ. We we don't make any provision for the flesh. So when those situations arise at home, and when two brothers are upset with each other, or two sisters, or a brother and a sister, or a husband and wife, or a parent and a child, whatever the whatever the relationship is, we have no way to fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is no way to do it when we put on Christ because we haven't made any provision for the flesh. There's no way to do it. So we'll look at one more, and then I'll close here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You 
You know, there's many times Paul says to, you know, act as a soldier uh, or put on armor or something. It's because there there is a war going on. And if we're so focused on fighting in the home, or maybe not just the home, but like I said, I, I think that's a little bit more common perhaps, but if we're so focused on fighting at the home, we're not going to be fighting the real war that the Lord is trying to equip us for. First Thessalonians chapter 5, we read of one more time, Paul says about being children of light, verse 5, First Thessalonians 5, 5, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. You know, that goes back to what we, the memory verse we just heard. Let's pay closer attention to things that we're hearing. Let's watch, let's be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. So once again, he says, be sober. And then you hear uh, similar to what we just read about the armor of God, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm convinced that, you know, again, the, what the Lord's been speaking to me, um, this war that we have against, against the enemy and against spiritual wickedness, we as children of the light, how are we ought to behave? And um, I'm convinced the devil absolutely loves when he gets between us in the home. And he's absolutely seeking to destroy every single relationship with the home, anywhere he can find any bit of a foothold. And I'll leave with this in verse 10. Uh, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, um, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. So as a church body, we shall live together with him, for him. So we're going to hear two more messages. And then after that, um, you know, there's going to be a time of sharing for, for all of us here. And, um, and I said, it's important that each one of us has a vision and whether, whether what is shared sounds like a vision or not, it is important that we, each one of us is hearing from the Lord, that we are equipped, um, that we take on this, the, the whole armor of the Lord. It says here in verse 11, I'll, I'll close with this verse. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. And I was really encouraged thinking about this as this last little part of this, uh, what we try to do on Sundays when we meet together. And I believe the Lord does, does give us grace to, to do this. It says, and edify one another or encourage and build up one another, even as also you do. It's a very encouraging thing. Um, so I, I pray that each one of us takes it seriously to edify one another, uh, build up one another. Amen.